In the last few videos, we've written three different recursive algorithms. And it's interesting to ask, ask the question, what is the order of these recursive functions that we've written? Now, it turns out there are formal mathematical ways that you can derive the order for recursive functions. We're not interested in going into that right now. We're going to be a little bit more kind of loose with our analysis. And what I've done, done here is I have drawn recursive trees for each of the different programs that we wrote. So first is the Towers of Hanoi. And here I am assuming that we start off with four disks. And of course, in order to move four disks, you move three disks, and then you move one at this level, and then you move three disks over here. But the move of three required moving two, and then this moved one, and then moving two again. And each of those was broken down as well. So the number of total disk moves that we have is equal to the number of uh, nodes that are in this tree. Well, how many are there? Well, we could count them up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Instead of just counting them up, though, it would be nice to have a formula for it. It turns out that each level here has a power of two uh, nodes in it because this is always doubling at each level. So one, two, four, and eight. If we had another level, it would go to 16. What is the sum of all of these different levels? Well, we saw that this goes up to 15. If we actually added one more level, it would go up to 31. We added another level, it would go up to 63. Turns out the formula here is 2 raised to the power of however many disks we have minus 1. Or, if we're talking about this in order, because we throw away that constant term, it's 2 to the n. Okay, so this is an exponential algorithm for the towers of Hanoi and turns out that's just what you have to do to solve that puzzle. So having a large number of disks would take a very long time. Over here, I have a diagram for generating permutations. And this is the list that gets passed in as nums. There's also a list for the permutation list which starts off as empty and then it would have values in it here. I didn't add that in because it kind of complicates the tree and it's not really what we're focusing on at this point. So we start off with one, two, three. The first recursive call took off the one and added it to the permutation. And so we were left with two and three. And then we would take off the two and be left with three or take off the three and be left with two. And similar types of things are going here. So the top level However many entries there are, that's how many calls we have. For the next level, there's one fewer entry in each of the lists, and that's how many calls we have. So for this one, we would get n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot, dot, dot. And at the bottom, we get times 2 and then times 1. Well, this is a function that hopefully you all recognize. This is factorial. And in some ways, we knew that this had to be factorial because there are n factorial permutations. And so we have to go through all of them. So there's no way that this could be any better than factorial. And the recursive function winds up doing factorial calls in here, which is order, order n factorial. Turns out that in factorial is exponential is bad, factorial is worse. Um, on a reasonable computer, for a two to the n algorithm, you could expect to possibly be able to go up to somewhere between 20 and 30, because two to the 30 is on the order of a billion. However, for the factorial, you're probably not going to go much above 15. Uh, the numbers start getting really big at that point. Our last algorithm, our last function that we wrote was the maze and searching through the maze. 
Now the way that that worked is it always called itself four times. So we had an offset. So if I started at zero, zero, we had a plus one in X, a minus one in X, a plus one in Y, and a minus one in Y. So we have four different calls from there. Now given the maze that we had, it, the things that go negative are definitely out of bounds, and this one here wound up running into a wall. And so it didn't branch very much. Only one of these was, a, was not a base case, and it called itself four times. And it turns out that of these, only this one would have not been a base case. Uh, and so then that one would go down and branch four times. The maze that we drew didn't have many junctions. Every time you hit a junction, you would have had, instead of just one case continuing on, you would have had two or possibly three cases continuing on. As long as your maze is fairly linear and doesn't have that many junctions, it turns out that the amount of work you do scales as roughly the size of the maze. Uh, it doesn't grow that much bigger than it. However, if you have lots of places where you have choices of where to go, lots of things that don't hit base cases. In that situation, you wind up having lots of branching here. It, you can't quite get to four to the end, which is what this would do if, um, if you never hit a base case. So, if you always branched four times, we would get something that was four to the end. Uh, but you really do hit those. The worst case maze is actually no maze at all. It's the one that a human would look at and immediately know how to solve. But because our recursive algorithm tries every single path, it turns out that we can, if you clear out all of the walls in the entire maze, and so it's just completely empty, there's a very large number of paths there. And it's not going to grow quite as four to the end. Uh, the worst you can have, actually, every time you take a step, you've left a breadcrumb behind, so you can't branch more than three. There are times where you're also going to be branching two and then you know the zeros for things getting cut off. So it's a fairly conservative estimate to say that for an open maze, this grows somewhat exponentially, okay, possibly as two to the n. What is n here, though? n is now the number of squares in the maze. It's now the number of steps, because that's how deep this tree is going to go. We're going to keep going down until we run out of squares to, to step on, basically until everything hits a, a base case, which means that for a 10 by 10 maze, we could actually go a hundred layers deep. There is a path that zigzags back and forth if you take out all the walls that goes down a hundred levels on this recursion. Uh, so the number here, while it's only growing exponentially, because n can be very large in a completely open maze, it turns out that, that a completely open maze will never finish. And it's just because there are too many paths. So as I said before, there are some formal mathematical ways that you can find the order of exponential algorithms. But at this point, what you should probably do is draw out a call tree and try to figure out from this call tree what the order is, how many times it's going to wind up calling itself, and from that, how much work it actually winds up doing. So that's it for this. We're going to come back and we're going to look at a few more recursive algorithms. In particular, we're going to look at some recursive sorts.